So what, um, well, any specific questions uh, right now? Because we're going to start kind of the open, open discussion after that. If not, we can, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Please stay up on stage here. We're going to pull together folks. Uh, if the previous speakers, we can all kind of come up on stage here and just maybe just sit down here. So we're all sitting down. Um, did, for the folks who are in the room, I would love to start this off by just getting a sense of, because uh, we want you talking too, right? So who is in the room here, right? Um, if you work as, as a component hardware uh, optics vendor, can you raise your hand? System vendor, hardware vendor, chip vendor? Okay, all right. We're going to try to get 100% here, so that's good. How about software? If you work on software as at a vendor, software at a vendor, okay, a lot of a lot of folks, great. Um, can I can I break that up into say open source versus commercial software? Do you work on commercial software? Commercial software, open source software. Okay, both. Okay, we got a few people with both. Okay, that's cool. Um, and then uh, let's say if you're an operator, are you an operator of a uh, of an enterprise? Any enterprise operators? We have a couple of different enterprise op I'm not sure if that was a stretch or uh, enterprise operators. How about telco? Telco operators, telco, all right. Um, and hyperscale, hyperscale, we have a few, uh, yes, hyperscale. So cool, we've got, we've got a little bit of a representation there across enterprise, telco, and hyperscale. Um, we have a lot of, um, software folks, so, um, and hardware folks as well, kind of from the vendor community. So with that, let's just, uh, let's just open it up to discussion here. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to do this from a recording perspective, if we have to, if we have to use the mic. Um, can you record the whole room talking or does, can you only record the, okay, if we're going to, we're going to try to speak to the microphones as much as possible, and if, uh, let's circulate around, if, and if we hand the ball around, um, try to uh, repeat the question if, if necessary, so. Oh yeah, that'd be great if we can, if we can do that. All right, so uh, let's start off. Any, for, first, any questions for folks? Uh, we can go to a kind of a more panel uh, format, then we'll kind of, I have a few questions to see it uh, overall. Any questions for any of the panelists? We already asked all those. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so one one of the seed questions or kind of the things that we talked about was um, kind of what do you feel is the the relationship between the open source projects and the commercial projects, uh, commercial software, right? And how would do you recommend? How do you recommend to operators navigating between both? That, that was a question I had gotten offline. Yeah, and I think that that actually is the crux of of uh, of the community and how, because if 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 end users are driving open source, and they don't need the vendors, there is no open source community. If vendors are influencing it in such a way that they don't meet end user requirements, there is no open source community. So this is absolutely critical for collaboration. So I'll start off with that, right? I think vendors and what we are seeing, and we will have some uh, analysts also do some research on what is different now than five years ago, is um, shared pains and shared problems in the boring areas. And let me call what boring areas are. Boring areas are the one that nobody makes money on in terms of end users, but they cost them money to operate, okay? those areas that a single vendor cannot have a product, they're the ones that will really thrive in open source, okay? So the one I was talking about, like ONAP, in terms of automation, there was not a single vendor in the community that had a product that can solve that. And when the community got together, the total bill that made up the community added up to $415 million. You know, we just did some math on the number of engineers and time and all that. Imagine going to a company and asking for that much money from a business case. That's not going to happen, right? So um, I think the role, you know, if if 
so that's one thing, right? Is from a business case, what projects are important are the ones that are common and common problems, right? Uh, the second thing that is kind of also important is the decisions of which vendors the end users pick are happening way, way, way ahead of the RFP and the RFIs, right? Because they're happening in the requirements in open source, right? Because the engineers are collaborating. So uh, there, is a, there is also a threat, but there's also an opportunity for vendors to participate very early and understand requirements so that not only can they contribute on open source, but build on top of that from a uh, innovation perspective and, and consulting and customization perspective. So you have an interesting perspective kind of I don't know if you, I could. I didn't see if you're raising your hand on both. Yeah, the, well, yeah, know, no, I think they're they're open both, source or, or commercial. Actually, they're both very interesting discussions. Again, because we're I'm in both sides. Again, as Arpit mentioned, you can't do open source without commercial software. Again, somebody has to pay the time and effort. Unfortunately, um, everybody doesn't have time to spend at home um, and then just uh, spend their free time at home to build solutions for everybody. Um, really, we needed the businesses to come in there to give to give the time to people to do these solutions. Where the open source gives back to the business is it's almost like an agile development uh, methodology. So again, businesses work really slow. Uh, again, just like Arpit mentioned, I, I can't go up to my manager and ask him for like a $5 million for doing an opportunity, but I can ask him for maybe $30,000 of people's time to get some stuff going with a community that then can bring in concepts that can bring in more money to the business, which will then allow them to proceed with those open source activities. So again, it's, it's through community activities that we, we can build up that open source and then drive that into business to get them to do uh, supported solutions and then drive that back into open source to make the open source better. <laughs> and then we have this nice circle going back and forth, very symbi symbiotic, sorry. How do you view, kind of on top of the Delta offerings, so um, from my perspective, I look at uh, different perspectives. So the first uh, issue that I see in the industry is that some of these commercial uh, provider of the NOS, they're not bringing their NOS, the big OEM, I mean, they're not bringing their NOS to the harder platforms. And certain areas for operators or s certain key areas that I mentioned earlier, it is important for, uh, for example, time synchronizations, right? P2P support, those kind of, uh, uh, these are complex elements also in the metro side. Those uh, software development takes time, right? So OEM vendor already have those softwares. They could bring it to open hardware and make the industry much more, um, uh, you know, it's viable for the transformation to happen. So this is one side. Another side I see the, the open source community. Uh, I see open NFB side that they are trying to put together all these ecosystems and trying to build some release out of it, right? But uh, let's say if I give you a open hardware with ONL and ONLP, how do I put Quagga in there, okay? So that kind of education, that kind of, how. Not only I put it in there, but how do I test this, right? That part is missing. And then how do I, if I have to connect with, uh, let's say, Neutron or Open, open Daylight, what is the southbound API I do connect to, right? Uh, for example, PCF is mis missing, BGPLS is missing, and so all this stuff is not there. So someone need to take a look at, or the community t need to take a look at, how do I take all these ecosystems, all these elements that are disparate as of today, and put them together and test it, and that make it. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Make sure. Yeah, so, so maybe this is an opportunity to kind of bring, bring I'm going to bring Steve, and put, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. <laughs> so there was a, there I was. I ask a deflecting question if Steve wants some time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let me just give, let me just give Steve a little bit of a, of a preview and then Rob, you can ask questions. So um, there was, there was a concept, there was a question earlier about the relationship, I think, between ONL and open switch. And then you just raised this question about, hey, if I have ONL and I have ONLP, what does that mean with Quagga or FRR, and, and how, does an, how does an operator bring those two together? So that's the question I'm going to get to you, Steve, if, just to kind of bring in the discussion with everybody else. But then, uh, Ravi, you had a quick question. Yeah. Um, this is actually live. It is. Um, so I, I heard uh, a couple people say, 
that uh, open source doesn't work without vendors. And, and I, I absolutely believe that's a, a viable model and one that's probably the easiest transition from, from where we are now. Um, but I, I have to say I'm surprised to hear you say that. I mean, certainly uh, some of the most successful open source projects didn't start that way. Um, I, I do think that it is tricky to find the right business model that works with open source and that for a large number of customers, and, and this, I, I, this will eventually turn into a question, but um, for too many consumers of open source, they think open source means well-tested, uh, well-executed, well-featured software for free. And, and trying to make sure that that message is clear that no, okay, you know, somebody has to build it and either it's the customers themselves or the vendors or most likely a, a partnership, I, I think is maybe a, a more nuanced but maybe clearer message at, at some level. I don't know, thoughts, concepts? Yeah, so I think I think that's a fair point. Um, the com there are components of open source that are free, right? And and those components can be used for deployments and production. Most of the open source community know that they need to get it production ready, right? So so that, that's not where the challenge is. Where the vendors come in is not only building pieces of those components, but also pulling it all together, right? Cust and then customizing it for the end users. That's where we see a lot of action. Specifically in the networking space, if you're not a Google, Microsoft, Facebook, you don't have engineers. Okay, let's face it. You know, telcos are hiring, but they are dependent heavily on vendors. Enterprises have one or two engineers who barely can spell IP addressing, right? So let's face it. Most of them are server peoples who look at, you know, oh, that's a switch, okay, you know, I'm just doing forwarding and we're done with it, right? So there is a reality check on organization. And so that's where when we start, when, when Linux Foundation, at, when we launch a project and when we see all the top 10 networking vendors active, top, top 10, that's a good sign. Because now what they're seeing is, you know, seeing that they're building on it, they're contributing back, they are integrating, they are commercializing, they are productizing, and solving the end user problem without necessarily worrying about uh, you know, interoperability bugs, right? Like flags are set incorrectly and you know, standards don't say it. Or, uh, you yeah, know, exactly, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so my point is, two biggest values that the end users get from this is they can give their requirements very early to vendors. Number one, the whole seven month of POC interoperability cycle is gone, right? So deployment time is really fast. And they have an op option if the vendors don't prioritize features to go in and modify it. So the control is there, right? So that's kind of what is driving both vendors and end users too. So it's, 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 it's happening. Yeah, I was going to also say um, it's just something interesting. So I started uh, software using Slackware. <laughs> um, again, wonderful thing, it, like lots of open source. In fact, I was really into assembly at the time. They had tons of it. I uh, really appreciated it. But again, there was still a business. The, the business was actually I bought the CD. <laughs> so it's just it's interesting. Again, I, I, I think the, the open source community, maybe it's better to say they're supporting each other. Again, there is a, a nice circle that you have in some cases, and that works out really well. We've seen, again, the Linux kernel is developed and being integrated with all the drivers, so like uh, integrated with tons of drivers, and I see that keep going. So again, I, I really see that nice symbiotic thing. I, it's hard for me to picture them completely separate, though. I. <laughs> Let, let's switch now from the panel format. Yeah, what's on your mind? And let's I wanna, just start. I actually yeah. want to encourage, maybe we'll all just go, go, there. go sit. Yeah. That, that would be sit. better. Thank bring, you. Bring the, so please help me again thank all the, uh, the speakers from, uh, from earlier. I really want to encourage us now to be, to be wide open, right? And so um, we're a small enough group here. I, I would almost even just have everybody just kind of turn the chairs or, or just turn in toward each other. Maybe what we're going to quickly do, and then we're giving you more time, Steve, here, is I'm just going to pass this around and just introduce yourself quickly. Let's start orienting together. If you all want to kind of move in more together here, 
Um, and that would be great. And apologies if that sort of scared off some folks, but <laughs> I, I, I definitely want to get this to be more of a sort of a, in a discussion, so. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Whitehouse from Metaswitch Networks, uh, networking software. Fantastic. And Paul Curtis with Sienna, building um, white box OSs and trying to sort of navigate the, the open source question as well. Oh, that's, okay. That's good to know. So this is perfect. This is perfect. If you can introduce yourself and, and then why, why you came to this session, kind of what, what do you hope for out of this, this discussion? Hey, I'm Juuso Lehtinen, Arista Networks. I'm here just to listen what's going on in the industry. Um, hi, I'm Thomas. I work for Google Networking Stack. That's... Hi, Vincent Zen. I'm working for Facebook on the optics side. Just want to understand how the industry is going on for the open, in, including hardware and software. Hi, I'm Steve Noble. I work on the Open Network Linux for Big Switch. It's uh, my primary job, just open source. I don't focus on the, on the elect, well, on the commercial software. And so, any questions for ONL obviously can bounce off of me and Rob, obviously, because he knows a lot about ONL. Hi, I'm Hari from CPAC at Networks. Uh, we develop network monitoring solutions for enterprises and um, service providers and high-speed data traffic networks. Hi, I'm Peter Fall of Inmon Corporation. Um, we developed the SFLOW standard that's implemented in Merchant Silicon, and we're really interested in working with people to make sure that that capability is exposed through the open compute platforms and, and software solutions. I'm from Oracle, okay. Yeah, hi, I'm Zubin Shah, I'm from KVM. Uh, KVM is an infrastructure silicon semiconductor company, and we are all uh, part of the open source o OCB community. Hi, uh, my name is Dilip Bairaju. I'm uh, working for Big Switch Networks, a solutions engineer for both uh, commercial and open solutions. Uh, I'm Chris Linklater. I'm from uh, Target, and I run an uh, uh, infrastructure performance and analytics team for, for the enterprise. Uh, my name is Chris Shea. Uh, I'm leading the uh, Huawei U.S. Open Source Program Office. Uh, the reason I'm interested in this topic is that uh, uh, I think it's very important that uh, the, uh, uh, the vendors' uh, commercial interests are considered in the open source projects, and otherwise, I think this is a very uh, important topic that we have already touched on, uh, touched upon during this uh, discussion. I think it will be more uh, can be discussed, and uh, I think that will be very interest, uh, interesting. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, Richard Pierce. I work at uh, E8 Storage. We're an NVMe over fabrics uh, solution provider. Uh, we're very dependent on uh, on the network, and we need to be very aware of the technologies that get buried within the network to get the performance we need. So I'm really here out of interest to see what the community is doing. Uh, my name is Juan Romo. I work for Juniper Networks. Um, I'm currently working in solutions. And um, Juniper is transforming, obviously, and we have presence with open contrail, which is used by some of the OCP folks. Um, in general, we're observing how the industry is moving and contributing to. I'm Steve Joyner with uh, Finisar Corporation and pursuing things that we can do to make optics easier to use and more reliable and helpful to, the, to this community. I'm uh, Rob Sherwood. I work at Facebook on the FBOSS team. I'm trying to lead the open source movement there. and uh, I'm here because I'm a professional busybody. Uh, DJ Spry at Abstra, uh, commercial intent-based networking management system for both commercial and open source solutions. So my interest here is uh, to understand all of the projects and programs and different interactions which we can uh, interface with. 
Uh, Tom Jinks, I work for MetaSwitch Networks. Uh, I'm here to kind of uh, see what the what the open source community, you know, see their future going forward as. Joseph Skinner, also with MetaSwitch. Uh, I came to the session just to learn more about what's going on in open source and how we can develop the commercial networking stacks to integrate with those open source NOSes. Mangesh Shingane, I work at Uber, uh, part of the data center team. I'm here to see what my options are in terms of open networking that we can actually take to production at Uber scale. Uh, name is Victor, Victor Liu at the Visa. Um, we run a network connecting banks and then eventually your credit card went through. So um, we used to buy a lot of commercial software to run our networks. Oh, I'm one of the network architects. Um, we're also looking at open source related tools. Uh, fragmentation, like Rob asked, were also existed in the commercial software, but the good thing is they provide you the professional service and then catch up with their products. For the open source, you know, you got the challenges like uh, um, April, April just mentioned, right? You have to get a professional team to maintain it. Um, actually, we even have a dedicated tools team to maintain all the commercial tools. Um, now with all the new you know, open source initiatives, we're looking at the balance of both world and then trying to minimize our you know, security is our, always number one availability and then the other things following the Vitas network. So that's all I want to share. Hi, Chris Escolia is with Orange uh, out of San Francisco. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I'd like to uh, see how we can leverage open source, whether it's hardware or software, white boxes, uh, how we can bring this in our network, make sure that, uh, that can, we can operationalize that. That's always a big uh, issue for us. It goes back to your thing, how we the testing and everything, so yeah. scalability and all that. Uh, Jonathan Chang from Delta Networks or Delta uh, Electronics. So we build a lot of uh, network switches, uh, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig. Uh, we're showing our 400 gig uh, network switch at our booth uh, in, in the show floor. So we provide a lot of network equipment to large ODM suppliers and uh, in those situations, we typically work with the supplier and get their software running on it. Um, we also supply a lot of products to the open network community, and on those we supply we support all the commercial software, you know, like the uh, Cumulus, Big Switch, uh, Picker Eight, and so on and so forth. But we have also invested a lot in um, uh, supporting uh, Oni, ONL, um, and um, Sonic Sci and so forth. Uh, we because we need to provide the solution to our customer. Hi, I'm Bob Oconi. I'm uh, with Dell EMC. I'm a network uh, engineer on the enterprise team in the central region. And I'm just here to get more information on open networking and open source that I can share with my customers. I think, you know, enterprise customers, I have interest, not a lot of adoption, at least in, in the central region. Uh, so the more that I can share with them, the hope I can encourage them to, to look at our solutions and other solutions. <laughs> at all, but it's, I think it's great, actually, just hearing kind of the perspective, you know, and you've got a great combination of, of software, uh, a few more enterprises and hyperscalers kind of, uh, um, than, uh, you know, than I thought, which is great. <laughs> so maybe to, maybe to start it off and we'll just circulate it. Okay, let, let me first pause. Let's get to Steve, to that one question. <laughs> I mean, keeping you one pause there for it, so. Um, ONL and open switch, what's your view? And then that ONL, how do you kind of work that together with, say, something like FRR or Quagga? So the interesting thing that I've seen this week is um, a couple of things that I, I knew had been done, but I hadn't actually seen demonstrated. And Jeff brought up one, which is that over in the IP Infusion booth, they're running Open Network Linux with Sonic on top of it, and then they're doing... Psi, which is actually a Psi translation to OFDPA, as far as I understand it. And then they're running the Redfish stuff on top of this pawn box. And it's, uh, it's really interesting to see what people do when they mix things together. 
right? You know, and to Cliff's point, and the point that I make, you know, almost all of us are Debian. You know, we have a very simple Debian, and from there, you know, we do the platform, and we focus very, we're very, very focused on the platform, right? It's a, basically the number one thing to us. To get to that next piece, there, there's a couple of options, right? We're working with the FBOSS team, and we're working on seeing, you know, does FBOSS also run on other switches? Is there a solution that people might be interested in? Um, there are options to do, we did the concept NOS, and if you know anything about ONL and the previous version, we had what we called the open route cache that Rob wrote on a plane in 12 hours um, that, that allowed you to do this translation between Netlink and the forwarding. And we have that again. We have it internally. And we're working on that, and we're trying to figure out, really, are there people who would be interested in that, and what are the, the features that they need, right? Because... I don't want to be out competing with people. You know, I want to let OPX do what OPX does, Sonic do what Sonic does, let the, let the world work with those. But I also want to be able to provide a solution to people if they just want something, you know, just plain Jane simple. And I'm hearing that around too. So I guess in a roundabout way, the answer to how do you work with Open Switch is we can easily come in and, and work with OpenSwitch just on the Linux layer. If we then need to do ONLP, we've got to work on a shim, but that's something that can be done. We already have Sonic running on top of it, which I'm, I'm happy to see. And then we have the ORC and other options. So there are a lot of ways that we can get to this. And, you know, it's it more to the customer, you know, the open source customer to tell us what it is that they're looking for. So maybe we can, maybe we can turn it around to some of the customers, right? I think there was Target, Uber, Visa, so I'm going to put a little spotlight on you just all. Just a little bit of a background. What do you want from us? <laughs> yeah, so just a little bit of a background. I spent, some of people here probably know me. Um, we tried looking at, um, so we currently have the standard OEM networking gear deployed in our Uber data centers. And the challenge that we took for ourselves is can we get a solution which works so well with the OEM equipment, can we recreate that solution with open networking solutions? And the challenge that I was given was is find feature parity first of all. I have these X number of features that are deployed using OEM equipment give me the same solution, otherwise your solution will not be accepted as a production solution. So that was the first problem I ran into, is all the open networking solutions that I evaluated, ONL, the protocol stacks that were mentioned in the slides, Quagga, FRR, SnapRoute, I mean all these stacks that are mentioned in these slides, the problems were the feature parity was the first one. Is I could not take any of these solutions and say that yes, I can replace what I have today working with these solutions. So feature parity, as a, I'm just giving a shout out to the community. Feature parity is very important. If you're talking about replacing traditional monolithic solutions with disaggregated models, feature parity is the number one bottleneck for customers like us. Second is reliability and scale. I brought some of these solutions in our labs light it up, links don't come up. Interoperability is not about BGP messages. Even at the physical layer, we had problems where the links wouldn't come up. And it took a tremendous amount of engineering, reverse engineering, to figure out that, okay, one vendor is not enabling particular settings in the chip correctly, whereas the other vendor is doing it. I could connect two switches running the same open networking solution on both sides, things work fine. I do a mix and match, nothing works. So that interoperability has to go from BGP all the way down to the physical layer. Right? So that was the second issue. Scale and reliability was the third issue that I ran into. Right? BGP timers. Right? 
we do not use BFD in our network. That's a different topic. But just to have better convergence, we have aggressive BGP timers. None of the open networking solutions were capable of holding on to those BGP timers and keep the sessions alive. When I scaled up my network in the lab to mimic what we have in the production. So these kinds of challenges have to be addressed before there is a wider adoption of these open networking <coughs> solutions. So can I, maybe I can, I thank you very much. This is super useful for everyone taking notes, hopefully. Um, can I maybe summarize a little bit? So you're looking for a, is it possible to get a drop-in replacement for, say, certain switches, right? Uh, the open source community, and uh, um, I don't know about your software engineering team or your network engineering team. Uh, Okay, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I think one of the questions would be, and that is, so as a requirement, right, that's one requirement for open source. Can you be a drop in replacement, or dis, let's say disaggregation, right? Can you be a drop in replacement for, um, or at least not a replacement, an alternative to, to be evaluating or, or having side by side um, with uh, the, the vendors you already use? Um, now there are there are a number of strategies we've talked about in the past, which are around, you know, you could get hardware, but with there are commercial NOSes that you know represented by companies uh, here. Um, that's one way to kind of go. You can you know all the way is you're going to go all the way to white box, which open source and forget the protocols and do something else and da da da. You know that's kind of all the way. You're converting everything, but you could go more piecemeal. I would. Anyone, uh, anyone want to comment from either software vendors, um, uh, the other folks? Yeah. Folks, over. you want to? Yeah, just um, if you look at why Facebook did FBOS, one of the explicit reasons that we looked into this was actually not for feature parity. We basically found that if we wanted to hit the other two things that you talked about, the reliability and the scale, what we need to do is actually remove features from our network. And it's, it's perhaps a subtle point, and it's certainly a harder one to swallow because until you kind of deploy, you don't really know the features that you know, I mean, that you need. Um, it, it is a little bit scary, and I, I think I, I gave a completely separate talk about like where companies are in this build versus buy spectrum. And so I mean, the, unfortunately with networking right now, we're in this step function, which is like either you buy everything or you build everything. And what I'm hoping that open source turns into is much more like open source in the web stack, where there's actually this very kind of smooth continuum of you can, if you want to set up a, a large web server, right, you can just outsource all of that. Or you can buy a little bit from Amazon and grab some open source. Or you can deploy data centers around the world and hire kernel compiler teams like we do. right? And there's kind of like a very clear continuum of what to do. And networking, frankly, just isn't that mature. And so you're looking at this as, well, either I have to hire the same size teams that Facebook and Google have, or I need to buy off the shelf. And unfortunately, I think you're right that that is too close to the reality today. But what I'm hoping evolves from here is, you know, as more of these software packages start to happen, as, you know, like Arpit Slide has, as more of those stacks start to evolve, as Omar Slides happen, as more of those stacks start to evolve, you can basically decide all right, we're going to take this long list of things off the shelf and have some faith that it's going to work, but this is the little bit that we're going to evolve on that the thing is that's important for your business, and that, that effectively has to be tied back to the specifics of your business. You want to, I just, uh, I, I, what I was thinking was what Rob just said, which is there's a paradigm of, you know, do, do the Ubers and the Visas of the world going to go all the way to the right and do everything open source, or is there a a crawl before you run approach where bits of it are open source, bits of it are commercial, bits of it are from you know, traditional commercial vendors. Because that's, that's where we sit and it's, it's, it's good to hear the different perspectives. So I'm curious from the other folks besides Uber, if, do they have the resources to, to do full open or, or what? Uh, Victor, you were kind of nodding your head. So. Yeah, yeah, so I, I want to comment um, on the third one um, you know, this gentleman have at Uber. Um, you know, when most of the open source here was talking about individual boxes, switches, especially, um, or maybe software around it. 
Um, so one of the big topics, like you mentioned, you didn't use BFD or you, how you use the protocol, how you connect them, is actually the wider or broader aspect of the networking, how you design your network, how you deploy it, and then eventually go into running of it. That's most of the network engineering or operators were running into, the problems they ran into. Instead of putting up a single devices, make interoperability and QA testing, those kind of things. Those are traditionally vendors work. They normally should do QA on their boxes and then building the network as a suggested or recommended solution. Um, in the past, I worked for a software company. We do automated network design. And then recently, there's a big trend which, you know, intent-based networking like Abstra, you know, he will talk more after that. But when we were POC with them, I really like the idea because they do a cookie cutter of your network. So you can easily build up the leaf spine and then monitoring, basically managing the whole life cycle, make the operation side very easy from design all the way to the operating. So that's what, what I want to answer or follow up on the certain points. He wants to Omar, can I add one? Oh yeah, I think one comment I was gonna make is as an enterprise, um, we decided to go open first as a strategy, but not saying we're gonna go 100% open. So if we look at the landscape and find that there's a good open source fit for what we wanna do, we'll go do that. Um, if we find that there's not a good open source fit, yeah, we'll go buy something. Um, and maybe in some cases there's an intermediate step. So um, not a network example, but if you're gonna transition from uh, Microsoft as an operating system to uh, being a fully open source Linux shop, uh, maybe you stop somewhere in the middle with a, a Red Hat that gives you a little bit of a cushion as you make that transition. So um, we're looking at strategies like that across the whole organization. Um, and then to comment on the staffing piece, so um, I'll speak from a network perspective. We have some of the best uh, vendor-led network engineers in the world. Um, and now we're asking them to be software engineers, and that's really uncomfortable uh, for them to be in that spot. So. Um, yeah, I don't think that we we have the engineering capabilities of a Google or a Facebook yet, um, but we're asking our engineers to skill up in those areas rather than to, you know, pursue traditional vendor-led, you know, training and certification. Yeah. So I was I was just going to, yeah, I was just going to add one thing to your comment on, uh, you know, the approach. And the things in the open source community that are gaining real traction is exactly what you said, right? Which is projects that bring things together, both from a test and automation perspective, as well as blueprints perspective. And I can give you a telco example, uh, and now it's getting into the enterprise, right? So ONAP, for example, did two blueprints, right? One on Volti, one on VCP. These are end VNF functions that pull in you know, thousands and thousands of lines of code, lots of cross projects, right? OpenStack, ODL, there's that, you know, you name it. And then they give you a blueprint that you can just deploy, right? But the way it works is the community got together, the end user community got together and they solved it in the open source community, right? The same thing is happening now with automation, you can get workloads to integrate, right? So I would say reverse the approach versus Picking, starting from the bottom, saying this software piece, this project, this pro, start from the workload, start from what your real application is. And I agree with Rob, you will find you don't need the thousands of bells and whistles because everything else is pre-integrated, right? It's, it's not, you gotta go the other way, right? It's a slightly different approach. Just make a Just, uh, um, wait, wait. Sorry, we'll move. So one of the challenges we face is that we have a working infrastructure, all right? And to the Rob's comment about features, right? We are picking the features that we want in the network. Now the challenge becomes is I have a network and I need to introduce open networking solutions into that existing infrastructure. So whatever I am using today needs to be there in the open networking solution. So we are not asking for other features. It's the integration into the existing ecosystem be it the OEM equipment, be it the automation and the management framework, that integration has to be there in the open networking solutions that we are going to bring on board. And that's where the challenges are. Yeah, I just want to add what you just said, you know, uh, like how we build quality into software, right, from day one. So you have to bake in from day one. Similarly, when build networks, we need to have monitoring solution 
built in from day one. So you can't really have a full network built and then go back and then start measuring where the problems are and try to isolate it. You have to find a solution from the day one, how networks can be troubleshooted and isolate the problem very quickly so that networks can be you know, self-governing themselves when it comes to the solutions. So isolate them and then make them in neutral blocks so that they can reconfigure themselves based on the intent or based on the problem. The proactive solutions that are coming up along is like you know, all predictive analytics or visualization techniques, they can help only one part of the solution. So we need to integrate all of them end to end to be able to isolate these things as soon as possible. So the monitoring has to come from day one. It cannot be at the later stages. So that's how networks can evolve. I was, yeah, I was also going to highlight again um, with with this evolution. I don't think there is this uh, this like hopefully we're not going to take that big step function again with the open switch and with the talk today. Again, it was all about open networking and bringing people in. Um, like actually, we've got three supported or three kind of supportable solutions already on top of open switch. And again, it's not that a um, it's not that there's not uh, open source uh, in addition to those things, and it's not that the open source works worse. Um, in fact, we don't know about all the possible open source out there. It's just that, again, these are effective solutions. Again, uh, we do need to have, I'm sure that even in the future, we will have paid solutions on top of, with open source. I'm, I'm actually a super strong believer in open source, but I still, um, in fact, uh, uh, anyways. <laughs> Uh, but but at the same time, I do recognize that uh, we do need these these extra things. Like let's say Visa needs a 2 a.m. call to fix the problem, um, they're going to need to call somebody to do that support, or they have to scale up the engineers themselves. Again, I think we just need to enable that community to have those options. Again, with OCP, we've really got nice APIs being developed, and as we get into these applications, again, working with uh, let's say. ONL and ONLP, or, or we have ONI as an API between hardware and software, we can actually just keep on refining these until we get the right APIs and then we have the right communities. Again, I think that's what, what we're here for. <laughs> actually, I agree with that. Um, if, um, there are several ways we could resolve this issue. And uh, let's take a look at Microsoft Sonic, for example. And uh, one of the things I talked with Microsoft engineer is why they have already contributed this software to the industry if they bring in their support and services for that software, then it would be a viable solution for everybody, right? And the same thing if open community now take, let's say, FRR or Quagga and put it on ONL and then bring in some layer two services to it and provide the, maybe a company, startup company or someone provides the technical support or support services, they can make money on support services uh, that model can go for OEM vendors, I mean, large uh, uh, networking gear providers, without mentioning the name, they could bring their software to this community, provide support and services, and make money that way, right? So that's an, an interesting switch in direction here, but let me, let's wrap up this area with Mansoor. I think you had one last comment here, and then we're going to, I want to switch a little bit the conversation to the yeah, uh, uh, topic. So Mansoor, uh, not, not, I don't want to be pitching any company, but uh, what, what I want to say though is that I agree with Rob that uh, taking an approach where it's fully open source, you know, no vendor support, we're going to do it all ourselves. I mean, I've seen uh, very, very, very few companies succeed with that. It's just, you know, a completely unrealistic uh, approach. Uh, what you really want to do is uh, make sure you 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 you, you uh, adopt adopt an aggregated. This is my experience. You want in, in this aggregated approach, like you want to have the ability to make choices in the stack, right? Uh, and you want to be uh, deploying your engineers on some of uh, the, the more specific aspects of your business, right? Things that are not you know uh, kind of boilerplate across every organization. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> you want the vendors to support it. And you, you want to choose where vendors are going to be building, and where you're going to buy, be buying from vendors, and where you're going to be building yourself. So, you know, it's it's fun to talk about, you know, the the, the you know this the the left, you know, fully open source versus right, you know, fully, you know, just one vendor. But the reality is always somewhere in the middle. Uh, and I would not, you know, one thing I would be very careful in is to underestimate how much it takes to really build, a, a, you know, a, 
in a, a, a product essentially that you're going to have to support right for the rest of time. There was a great quote from uh, uh, a financial. Uh, they said that uh, you know they built out their own development team and they built out their own tooling, and then they got locked into their own tooling, which was the worst kind of lock-in, right? When the engineers that built you know, your software, you know, moved on to other opportunities and then you're left kind of holding the bag, right? That's a, that's, you know, whereas with a vendor, of course, you know, you, the vendor will be supporting you uh, and will be there for you, right? <laughs> well, so. yeah, the, there are lots of ways you can, you can, you can mitigate that, right, with, uh, with the right contracts. So I wanted to turn this around, or not turn it around, but to kind of switch it. We thank you all for uh, kind of representing some of the the user view. Um, I'd love to hear. So at least the projects within OCP so far, right between um, um, Oni, right to a certain extent, and and I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put words in Cumulus's mouth here, right? But Oni somewhat started from the vendor point of view, which was to say, hey, we're we're gonna provide a commercial software NOS. We need a way to load NOSes on flexibly, so they develop Oni, right? Um, ONL and Psy Sonic, to a certain extent, a little bit of a combination. But like, let's take the Psy perspective. A lot of vendors have been interested in the Psy because they're saying, "Give us an API to write to. Don't give you know which one can we write to that we can get some consolidation around." And so now you see you know a couple of uh, operators trying to really pushing uh, Psy, you know, Microsoft and Alibaba. Um, so to the vendors in the room, what would you like from the software community? Like what would, or, and, or from the OCP community? We came up, you know, we or other vendors came up with ONI, uh, help drive ONL, help drive uh, Psy. Do you have requests uh, to the open source community or stuff that you would want other, other companies in the room or yourself? You can say, hey, we want to start up this optical monitoring initiative. Right, um, it's a better way to um, you know, get view into that. Uh, others, other ideas of, from the vendor side. So we'll, we'll hand off microphones to software and hardware vendors. Or you don't want any open sourcing. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> so maybe, maybe one uh, one observation, for example, just with our experience with Sonic, is that uh, uh, sometimes you know that that's part of the problem with community. It would, maybe one you know the good thing and the bad thing about community is that decisions take some time. You know, it's like you have to make decisions in, you know, in the Congress, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so, so meaning that a lot of times there are some, uh, like you know, maybe some of the you know uh, organizations here want to uh, contribute code back into the community, and then these are really good contributions, but yet you know they get you know rate limited, and so you know you're really getting a subset, a very kind of small subset of what's really there, right? And it's just really much less useful, right? So what can be done to to really accelerate the rate of you know uh, contribution into the uh, open source, uh, especially from organizations that are using the, the the open source software, such as you know, the users of Sonic, right, mm -hmm. contributing into the uh, Sonic ecosystem. That's a good request. So one thing I've seen is usually all these open source, all Sonic, OPX, uh, they they end up being more dev type of code. Uh, we haven't seen a full solution stacked together, somebody standing behind it. Okay, I, I think what we're missing, unless it is there and I'm not aware, is somebody testing with use cases from Uber, Target, like a full solution together with in a data center like Rack. Uh, is there something, I know UNH we started like uh, for a while, but it does not go all the way to stack and the management plane. Uh, are there plans from the networking uh, subcommittee or the group to handle such things? Um, so I think that's an interesting opportunity, which is, you know, we've talked about there are all these disaggregated pieces. Who integrates it back together and provides that support, the one neck, the th one throat to choke, the, the whole thing that's going to kind of be a drop-in replacement or for whatever part of your solution. Um, so there's opportunity there for companies. Um, OCP, I think we're going to try to, you know, invest more as, as much as we can within the interoperability testing, but it's not going to be, you know, is it, are they going to certify to say like this is 
um, this is going to be drop and replaceable and completely compatible with what you have now. I think that's that's not their role. Uh, although to your point, I think you brought up, uh, hey, just basic link would be pretty good. You know, if we can make sure that the link <laughs> link comes up, and you're not trying to like verify complicated BGP route policy. You're just like just bring up the link, um, and we could do a better job with that. I think, and and that is kind of what. Uh, we actually had a recent call on the OCP uh, group to say, is anyone interested in L2 interoperability testing to try to go up a little bit, you know, even beyond link? Not a lot of people indicated interest in that, which was sort of uh, an interesting data point for me. But trying to push up, trying to push up the stack, I'll, I'll be fr frank, people want us, have asked for more up the stack functionality, but it's hard to get people to really move as a community up the stack. Um, and so that's why I think to a certain extent we've, we've provided lower level software components because there's a lot, we've had a sort of agreement around that, we got more alignment. Um, but I'd be curious to hear what other folks, do Do people want OCP to move into oh, yeah. analytics stack? Very important for us, right? I mean, that's the kind of uh, personalization I talked about, right? I mean, how do you bring that into a network which like ties with what they uh, target and, and uh, you know, Uber guys are saying, right? So for my, for my point of view, integration is like number one pain point. I mean, and who's going to be the next Red Hat that can actually provide that? Now, of course, you have to be like, you know, what's going to be the business model? I don't know what, why there's no interest when you're talking to these companies. You know, they want to, they don't want to step up, because they have to see a business opportunity, right? If they don't see the business opportunity, they're not going to step up, right? So I don't know. I can I can also add a little bit to that. Um, it's there. There has been no one size that fits all. Uh, that's what I've seen. Um, so again. The funniest thing is that uh, we have like a four or five integrated stacks on OpenSwitch, and I've seen them all being discussed. In fact, uh, just today I was in a call with a, a Russian bank that was quite excited about Bird. Um, they said, I really want Bird on the stack, and it, it has to be Bird. Um, and that has the best VRF that I want. Like again, it's just arbitrary things. So the, the small thing when you get into these standardizations is that bringing the world together is bringing the world together. I expect it's gonna take a significant amount of time. Um, again, if we, we start to do these small successes, and I think we got a lot of small successes and build these component, composable things, then at some point we can get there, we can get to that spot where we can have maybe not the, the, the full world in one package solution, but enough components that have been trialed together that people will take, take that next step. And again, I think that's what we're all working towards, or at least I, I know based upon what I've heard today anyways, we're all working towards it. You had someone, the, were you from Juniper? I don't just, just briefly, um, so uh, as a vendor, um, pretty much enterprise is knocking the door, repeating exactly your words. Um, so as a vendor, we are observing very carefully what's going on. Um, we're in the business of making money, obviously. So, uh, but uh, what I see, and this is back to when routers started in the internet, it, I see the same kind of uh, situation. Uh, at the very beginning, we didn't have good standards. Then Jacob Rector derived the three napkin protocol. Um, I was with him in IBM in those days. And then the whole industry started. I see this at the very beginning of something. I don't have a crystal ball, but it could something could happen. As a vendor, we're carefully looking, and as I said, Juniper is participating in areas, in many different areas, um, but it, it'll take a while um, to, to get to. I, I don't see any way of getting a standard here. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of people building blocks, but it'll take a while. I think we have a couple more comments, then we, we have come to the end. I'm, I'm happy to sit, who, who, whoever wants to sit around and, and chat, um, but I think we had Rob and um, Victor, I, and then let's go for three here. I, I, I can be quick, I realize I'm monopolizing the mic, but you know, just to, to riff on actually what the, the last two people said, like I will claim that we are, you mentioned Slackware, like I remember downloading 27 floppy disks worth of Linux and having like disk number 18 stop working and like I'd had to go back and download that again. Unfortunately, I think that's where we are right now in terms of this. There's a bunch of open source pieces that are starting to evolve. Some of them crash, some of them miss features. Um, if you think of how mature the open source community need to be, the individual components need to be before something like Red Hat was even financially viable, I claim we're not there yet. 
that there's there's motion, there's direction. I think there's a lot of interest, but you know the individual pieces have to be, frankly, in a better shape. And that's why you know I, as somebody who kind of bounces up and down the stack, I focus on the individual pieces. Like it's not that I don't know that the solution is what's needed, but I think this is the thing that's most lacking. And then as the individual pieces start to be get a little bit more polished, it gets easier to make a full stack solution in a way that from a business perspective is actually viable. That, that's my take. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm from Huawei. So it's, uh, one of the things that we're very uh, interested in is the discussion of uh, open source as an external R&D. It's very challenging because uh, as Huawei as a company, they produce a lot of hardware. Uh, a lot of their products are pretty much black box. Uh, now, changing to open source model, ideally and theoretically, uh, we would hope that open source is the, the new product development model where companies can all contribute and uh, innovate and differentiate a certain uh, unique uh, either features uh, or uh, other things. That's one way. The other way, uh, that's from company perspective, how they treat open source. Uh, from the open source community, I would also encourage uh, community to uh, bear in mind the vendor's interest. When we design software, or we may build in those kind of uh, capabilities where allow vendors to have their own uh, unique implementations. Because at the end of the day, freelancers, you know, I contribute to open source. I just do it for maybe a few hours. I did something I thought community will need it. I just put it for free, everybody can benefit. That's great, but that's not sustainable. And for me, I'm just doing this for fun, right? That's all. But for make these uh, communities thrive and grow and a lot of commercial adoption, all the developers, I will say that we all somehow see ourselves as a company developers. When we design things, we design those commercial interests into the software so that uh, companies can also survive through those open source product developments. Uh, that's the other side. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, we have to. We, we can continue talking, but we're going to uh, end the recording <laughs> uh, uh, for the for the uh, for the FN Tech folks. So, thank you all for coming. Thank you for um, participating in the roundtable. Really uh, enjoyed the discussion. All right. Thank you.